What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video. My name is Sam. This is the Keep On Coding channel and today we're going to be talking about web APIs. And I hate long intros and you probably do too. So let's just get right into it. So what is a web API? Well, before we dive into this, let's define what an API is. API stands for Application Programming Interface. And what that is, is an interface that provides a set of functions to a user where the underlying mechanism of that function is hidden. A good real world example of this is an elevator. An elevator provides you an interface in the form of a set of buttons. You press one of those buttons and the elevator takes you to the floor. You don't really care how the elevator is moving up and down, you just care that once you push that button, it takes you to the correct floor and the door opens. There are many different types of APIs. Your operating system provides an API to the applications that are running on it. For example, open is a function provided by the operating system that an application can use. So when you're using an application and you try to open a file, what's actually happening is your application is asking the operating system to go open that file for you. Other functions could be kill. For example, when you close an application, you're calling the kill function on that application. You can also call reboot to reboot the entire system. All right, so that brings us back to web APIs. A web API is basically just an API that travels through the internet. You have the client, which is the caller of the API, and the server, which is the respondent. This here is a client server model. The client makes a request to a server that gets routed through the internet. The server receives the request and performs whatever action was requested by the client. The server will have several endpoints set up that perform different actions. These actions could be something like retrieving data from a database, posting new data, or deleting existing data. Once the server performs whatever it needs to on its end, it returns the response back to the client. Data gets passed around through the web using a protocol called HTTP which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. How do you send a HTTP request? You can use a tool like your standard Chrome browser. An example of this request can look like the following. It starts with the protocol, so your browser knows what protocol to use. You need to provide a host, so it knows where to route the request. Then you need the path, so once you reach the server, it knows what action to perform. You can also have an optional query, Say your request is creating a new user and you want to provide the name for that user, you would provide it as part of the query string. And that's what a standard HTTP request looks like. And this should look very familiar because whenever you type a URL into your browser, you're calling a web API. Now, when you get a response from the server, there will be a status code associated with that response. This lets the client know how the request went. If everything went as expected, there will be a status code in the 200 range. However, you could also receive a status code in the 400 range. This means that something went wrong when the client created the request. For example, if the path doesn't exist, you would receive a 404 error. Statuses can also be in the 500 range, meaning that something went wrong on the server side. Now, what does the data that gets sent over look like? Well, the two main formats that are used are XML and JSON. XML stands for Extensible Markup Language. And as you can see, it looks very much like HTML, but the tags are defined by the developer. In our example here, we're passing three fields, name, age, and salary. So the client would send this data in the body of the HTTP request, and the server would then know how to parse it out and get the appropriate data. Likewise, we have JSON or JavaScript object notation, which has a different format, but the purpose is exactly the same to transmit data from the client to the server. So which one should you use? JSON is usually the preferred format because a lot of times when you're making the API call, you're using JavaScript, which integrates well with JSON. It's easier to read and has a smaller size because we don't have those open and closed tags that you get in XML. Most modern APIs use JSON, but some older ones may use XML. So you should be familiar with both. Now the client and server need to have an agreed upon way to send these requests so they can understand one another. One popular way is to use REST, which stands for representational state. A service implementing the REST architecture is called a RESTful service. REST provides interoperability between a client and a server, and it is defined by its architectural style. So what does a REST call consist of? Well, you first have the endpoint. This would be just like the HTTP path that we mentioned in the previous module. Next is the method. This defines what kind of action you're making. A few examples are a get, post and delete, which we will take a look at in a moment. You have the header. Headers contain information about the type of request. 
For example, are we using a JSON or XML format? Finally, we have the body. This would be something like a JSON object. So let's take a look at an example. Here I'm using Postman, which is a tool you can use to make API calls, very similar to the browser. As you can see here, we have our path here, which is dummy.restapiexample.com. And on the left here, we're making a get request. So what this does is it calls this server and it returns all the employees that they have. If we want to enter a new employee, we need to change our method to post. We need to change the path to have a create at the end. And we need to include a body of the actual employee that we're adding. So our format is going to be JSON. And we pass in an object with name, salary, and age. And we hit send. As you can see down here, we get a status of 200, which means that it was a success. And the client has an ID of 63. Now, if we make an API call to employee slash 63, we see that it returns a success with the name of the employee that we just added. The next topic is backend APIs. So we need a way to build our web API on the server itself. This is implemented using some kind of backend programming language like Java or Python. Pretty much all your major programming languages are going to have some kind of framework for standing up an API. For example, if you're using Java, you can use Spring. If you're using Python, you can use Django. If you're using JavaScript, you can use Express. Finally, I want to talk about versioning. So what happens if you need to update your web API for any reason? Many applications could already be calling your existing API and you don't want to break those existing calls. This is where versioning comes into play. You may have noticed in our previous HTTP request, we had this V1 in our path. This stands for version one. Initially, it doesn't mean much because we only have one version of our API. But say we want to add a new query parameter. Instead of only having a name, we now require an age. We change our path to now have v2 with the age in the query string. Now, applications calling v1 will still function, and any new applications can call our v2 endpoint. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully you guys learned something new. Make sure you guys smash that like button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, all that good stuff. But I want to thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you guys in the next video, and remember to keep on coding.